was in dispute. You know, and again, how much of that is unique and distinctive to East Asia and to China with Confucian cultural values, with authoritarianism, communism, all of that, and can't be exported to a more dynamic civil society that we see in most African societies. And so that is a question that we, we don't know yet. That being said, the places where it's doing the best it are places that are less democratic, that more closely resemble the Chinese model. So Ethiopia is oftentimes put up as the poster child for all of this because they have a system that is far less responsive to civil society. And then the government can say, let's do this. And then it gets done, or at least they try to. So, for example, the special economic zones. This is something that the Chinese uh, model, they did not invent the special economic zones. They're oftentimes credited with that, but that is not their, their invention. But that's something they perfected in many ways. And they have tried to bring over to Africa. And so we see one after another of these SEZs or these industrial parks, they're called. Hawassa is the big one in, uh, in Ethiopia, where they have their own infrastructure. They have their own tax structure, their own regulatory structure, uh, no duties in, on imports or exports for raw materials and then for finished goods. And the idea is to generate employment. That is a Chinese model that they are trying to bring into Africa all over the continent. And there are mixed results as to whether it's working or not. The Chinese will tell you, oh, it's great, it's glamorous, everything's great. But, you know, Mauritius has had one and they've not done very well. Uh, Ethiopia's had some, but there's a lot of state spending to support it. So we don't really have any clear vision on this. So there is a model on that to look at. But again, I think what it comes down to is, does the world want more libertar- liber- you know, liberal capitalism from the United States or from the European Union, the IMF structural adjustments, or do they want a more holistic uh, capitalism in, in the guise of an authoritarian model that the Chinese are doing. And that's a real intellectual ideological discussion that is going on right now. And I get the sense that African policymakers are saying, you know what, I want a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then you look at France, where you are right now. I mean, this is a country that has 56% of the economy is run by the state. That is an enormous amount that's controlled by the state. And so state companies in the French model also offer an alternative. So it's not an authoritarian capitalist, but it's a socialist capitalism like the Europeans have. So there are a lot of models and you get the sense that a lot of PhDs and think tanks in Africa are kind of sampling around the world, almost like a buffet and saying, I want this and I want that. And there's a lot of experimentation going on. And I think that's a very, very exciting thing to see right now. One of the one of the. The the problems, I guess, for countries who choose to to go down a more state-driven route um, is, you know, when, when things do get captured by special interests, then a lot gets captured. Um, uh, I guess, you know, maybe we, we could talk to that problem in, in, in Zambia uh, a, a little bit. W- what has happened since, you know, there were all kinds of rumors flying around of uh, Chinese officials sitting in the Zambian central bank and saying, pay this invoice, don't pay that, that invoice. Um, how, how are things today with, with Zambia's own debt crisis? Zambia is in trouble right now. I think Africa Confidential wrote an article a couple of weeks ago where they said Edgar Lungo is running out of options. Uh, there are two major problems in Zambia right now, is that Lungo has not managed uh, his investments well from the Chinese. So he's been using uh, money from the Chinese to pay for salaries, administrative costs. Those are things that don't generate future growth. Uh, he has not invested in infrastructure. He has not invested in education, and he's been paying salaries and whatnot. The other part of that worrying in Zambia that uh, Africa Confidential brought up is this question of we don't know the full extent of the debt. And this is a problem actually not just in Africa, but around the world. And I've heard in some parts of Southeast Asia, uh, someone told me confidentially that the gap between one country's, their counting of the debt in South Asia and what China's counting of the debt was a difference of $13 billion. (laughs) Nobody can agree on how much is owed. And so imagine if you're a Moody's or you are a, a bank or you're an investor trying to evaluate Zambia's financial health. It's very, very difficult, if not impossible, because of these hidden debt bombs that are sitting off book. And the Chinese have been, you know, facilitating that. But we don't know to what extent. We don't know how much. And this is one of the big mistakes when we say the Chinese, and it's as destructive and misleading as saying Africa. There is no Africa. There are 55 states. 
There are, well, 55 members, 54 states. Uh, China is just as large and diverse as well. And you have a lot of actors involved in these debt negotiations or who are lending money that don't coordinate with one another. There's not a room full of 10 men sitting around a table coordinating everything. So, so Zambia is a good case study for what can go horrifically wrong. And they are at the mercy of copper prices right now. And again, he only does well and be able to pay back these debts if copper prices stay high. The minute copper prices dip below a certain level, Lungu is underwater. And what we're hearing about the Chinese right now is they're not showing an enormous amount of patience with Lungu about debt rescheduling and debt cancellation. That's interestingly not what we're seeing in other parts of Africa, where the Chinese have been rescheduling parts of Ethiopia's debt, Republic of Congo's debt, and whatnot. But in Zambia, the Chinese are saying, uh-uh, you're going to pay us back, and we're not going to reschedule. And so that's why Africa Confidential and their sourcing is saying that he's running out of options, and I do think that as well, from all the different points of view that I see. Uh, there's a frustration on, this, on the Chinese part with Zambia, that uh, it's not been easy for them to, to manage the mines going all the way back to the Colum mine, you know, five, six, seven years ago, which was a private sector investment, but caused enormous headaches for the Chinese government. And so Zambia has always been a very, very difficult place for the Chinese. It's also the epicenter now more and more of an anti-Chinese backlash that's coming. And the Zambians seem much more prone to fake news. We heard for a long time about, uh, you know, China exporting human meat. China is taking over uh, Zesco, the power company. China is taking over ZNBC, the, the national broadcasting company. And this comes to your point about whether or not are there Chinese people sitting in there saying, pay this and pay that and pay this and pay that? My experience talking with stakeholders in both the Zambian side and the Chinese side is that those are generally not true. And those are fueled and facilitated by a very, very lively and active social media uh, ecosystem. There I said it, sorry. Um, so it is that, first of all, Zambia is too small for the Chinese to care that much. I spoke with somebody in the Chinese foreign ministry a couple months ago about the ZNBC rumor that China had taken over uh, ZNBC. And he said, have you seen ZNBC? He says, it's two sticks and a light. There's nothing there. I mean, like, don't flatter yourself that we would be interested in ZNBC. There's no value to it. It's a tiny little TV station or TV network. I mean, I don't mean to insult Zambians or ZNBC, please forgive me. But when you're coming from a $12 trillion economy, and when you're used to dealing with TV networks like CCTV, ZNBC is kind of small scale, and there really isn't a lot of commercial value in it for the Chinese, say for other people. So these oftentimes are rumors and projections that are put upon the China-Africa relationship or the China-Zambia relationship. One other very, very quick point on Zambia. Oftentimes now the Chinese have been singled out by the opposition as a safe way to criticize Lungu. It's becoming increasingly difficult and dangerous to criticize Lungu. But by criticizing the Chinese as a proxy for Lungu, they know the Chinese will not fight back. They know the Chinese will not answer. So you get a free punch at Lungu by criticizing the Chinese. Again, another filter to think about when you evaluate China-Zambia relations, how much is being sucked into domestic politics and really not necessarily rooted in fact so in what the China-Africa China, with that in China mind, Zambia relationship uh, is Let me put it to you that we will see in the next 12 months – uh, global downturn, um, partly because of business cycles ending, partly exacerbated by trade wars, um, and global demand for commodities will fall with that global downturn. Will we then see more uh, hidden debt bombs exploding over the continent? How many of them will be Chinese, and what will be the impact? Well, and again, remember, too, that the Chinese economy itself is changing. So 15 years ago, uh, China was an exporting country. And even without the trade war, China was undergoing these really profound changes where it didn't need as many uh, raw materials, commodities to manufacture things because it's becoming a services economy now built on consumption, much like the U.S. That is the natural kind of maturation of the Chinese economy. So what we're seeing today was bound to happen. I think it's being expedited by the trade war. But this was this was the trend that things were going. You know, there's that saying that when the uh, when, when the water goes out and the tide goes out, you see who's wearing a bathing suit. And uh, and I think that we're going to see that in Africa, in many many parts of Africa. Those economies that have managed their debt well uh, will be okay when the commodity prices fall, as they are prone to do. 
Uh, China increasingly is buying less from Africa, and it's really indicative of the fact that economically speaking, Africa is becoming less important to China by the day. Let's not forget that all of the trade with Africa wrapped up in one comes up to 0.39% of China's total global trade balance. <laughs> less than 1%, less than a half of a percent. They, they do $4 trillion a year of business and they're getting about $200 billion, $220 billion from China, from Africa. So economically speaking, it's a rounding error. In fact, Germany does more business with China than all of Africa combined. Now what we're seeing is in South America, their trade has zoomed up north of $300 billion. So they're doing a third more trade with, with the Americas, Latin America and the Caribbean, and, uh, than, than they are with, with Africa. Now that doesn't mean that Africa isn't going to be important to China. What it means is that economically it's going to be less important. And that means that there are probably going to be fewer loans that come from the Chinese into Africa. They're going to be concentrated generally in the Belt and Road area. So a lot of that, that money is going to be concentrated on Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, leading all the way up into Egypt and the Suez Canal. That's where their strategic investments are going to be made because it benefits them the most. If you're sitting in Botswana or a landlocked country or in North Africa, uh, you know, in the Sahel, uh, it's going to be more difficult to tap into Chinese money. And that's going to be part of the downturn as well. But because China's diversified its economy in such a way that it can source tim timber, minerals, and oil from pretty much anywhere now, the Middle East, the Gulf, South America, uh, maybe the Arctic very soon, it doesn't need to rely on Africa the way it did 10 years ago. And that will also change the dynamic a lot. And I think that's a very important thing that we look out 12 months, look for more political engagement, more UN support, more of China rallying the African delegation at places like the Food and Agriculture Organization, which just this year had a big showdown between the U.S. and Africa, uh, U.S. and China, where the entire African delegation on the first vote supported the Chinese candidate. The entire delegation of Africa supports China at the U.N., on Xinjiang, when the United States is trying to raise the issue of condemning China for human rights violations in Xinjiang, not a single Muslim or African country rose up in the U.S. defense. They all rallied behind the Chinese. On Huawei, every single African country said, you know what, America, you can, you can take your concerns and go away. Cyril Ramaphosa in South Africa said, you're jealous. Kenya's ICT minister flatly told the Americans, we will make decisions about our ID infrastructure without your input. Amazing. That's where I see the China-Africa relationship going in the next 12 to 24 months, and less on timber, minerals, oil, and copper. That's very interesting, and, and kind of mirrors the way, I mean, Francophone Africa always used to back France's own positions at the UN Security Council. I think African countries are saying, is Xinjiang a core strategic interest for me? No. So you know what? Sure, I'll stand behind the Chinese on that one. I don't lose anything. Huawei, same thing. So there's almost, you know, they're not going after core strategic interests of the Chinese and challenging them. No one is inviting the Dalai Lama to come to, to Africa anymore. That's something that happened in, in South Africa and Botswana, but those days are gone. So in that sense, I think that they're rallying around because they see their core strategic interests not to alienate the Chinese. That's, uh, you know, whereas uh, I think the French had a much tighter grip on, uh, on Gabonese society, for example. You could argue it still does today. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, listen, Eric, thanks so much. This has been uh, incredibly enlightening. Um, t tell our listeners again where they can find your, you, you personally and, and also the China Africa. Well, we'd love to have everybody come over to the ChinaAfricaProject.com, where, we, again, we have our subscriptions. And you can subscribe to my daily email newsletter that I'm putting out. Uh, every day I spend about four or five hours putting this thing out. It goes out at 6, 6 a.m. Washington time. Uh, middle of the day, lunchtime in Europe and Africa. Uh, so go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe for that. But if you'd like to follow me on Twitter, where I'm posting every single day on the latest China Africa news, you can find me at EOLander. And every week, uh, Kobus, my partner in South Africa, we produce the China in Africa podcast. And we'd love to have you as part of that community as well. Just look uh, for it on wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us. And our thanks to Eric for that chat. Check out the Africa China Project for more. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter, head to theafricareport.com. And did you enjoy this podcast? If you did, 
go and rate us. Go and give us a big fat five-star review. It really helps us and it really helps other people to find us. 